Is it seen? No, we can't see your presentation. Do you want me to share it? Uh, oh, no. I'll just quickly send it to you then. <laughs> One second. Sorry for the inconvenience, guys. I'll just quickly send in my presentation. All right, I believe it has been sent to you. You must have received it right now. All right, awesome. Um, so before the whole presentation chaos is fixed, um, there's too much sunlight. The weather is nice, isn't it? Um, I'm certainly enjoying it in the UAE, but it dep depends where you all are from. Uh, so yeah, today we were supposed to be having an expert talk by uh, Mr. Todd Riccariero. He is a Master of Science in Astronomy and Astrophysics, and he studied in California Polytechnic um, School, and also he's been a professor for many, many years. Uh, he's pretty old, and he has the wisdom of his age, too. He's very smart, and I met him recently, and he's been able to pass on a lot of information uh, to me. Uh, yeah, talking about me, I've introduced myself, right? My name is Fida, and I'm a junior in, at Raha International School. I study in grade 11, and my interest lies in the field of astronomy, as you might have guessed, right? Uh, so today, Mr. Todd hasn't been able to attend our program due to uh, technicalities and personal schedule issues, but we have booked him uh, for our workshops coming in the next few weeks. Uh, so he'll probably be there to give us some advice and talk about some interesting, cool things on astronomy. Hey, right. uh, quickly check in with Southwick about the presentation. Yeah. Can you it's... see the presentation? Can you yeah. see the... I hope all of you can see it. I can. Uh, so yeah, welcome guys. Uh, thank you so much for joining and keeping aside some time uh, to join in. So yeah, uh, welcome. So can you about, still see it? Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Can you still see it? Sorry. Yep. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. No problem. So here I I introduce myself. Satvik, would you like to introduce yourself to them? Uh, hi everyone. I'm my name is Satvik. I'm a high school graduate currently in my gap year. And I've been associated with uh, Astrobeat since the beginning since July. And uh, we've come a long way in developing the program and everything and connecting experts. And uh, Thanks for joining, guys. You may turn on your videos if you want to. Uh, if we upload this anywhere online, we'll blur your faces if that's of any concern. And do ask your questions to us. And uh, thanks for joining us. Awesome, awesome introduction, Sadhvi. Thank you very much. All right, about us, right? Astrobeat. Very, very um, maybe absurd name, but there's a reason behind it, right? Uh, I am very interested in astronomy and music as well. Um, they, they too, both of them, both the skills are some my interdisciplinary uh, skills. I don't know if you, if you could call that. It's one of my passions, right? So back in last year when I was in grade 10, uh, I decided to combine both of this for social social good, right? Astro, astronomy and music. It was, it was a it was a hard task, right? And uh, when it came into reality, I was really happy. So the main idea of Astro Beat is to use music for the better good in the field of uh, the professional career of space, right? Uh, so Seth, could you go on to the next slide? All right, we're done with this. So we had a launch webinar, two launch webinars actually last year, and it was hosted in time of November, December. We, we had over 30 registrations, which was uh, really, 
happy for me because we were in our development stages and having 30 students inter interested in our workshop was really, really um, a happy thing for me. So the schedule for this workshop uh, was supposed to be uh, including our expert um, mentor who's going to give us a talk regarding astronomy and other cool things. But today, me and Southwick will be our only presenters and we will be moving forward with the program, right? Awesome. All right, so we're gonna talk about how music can be beneficial beyond Earth, right? Um, not just on, on planet Earth, but beyond Earth as well. And basic uh, conversations on music therapy. We're keeping it very standard and basic because we have young minds from all grades, ranging from uh, grade five to grade 10. So these are all just basic conversations, just starting off um, you know, your involvement in music therapy and astronomy. In the future workshops, though, we would have separate categories for depending on the age level, so on and so forth. Right, let's move on. Stress in space, right? Um, stress in space, I feel like we all are stressed, right? By different things, maybe work, um, studies, studies, we all are students, I bet we relate about uh, being stressed about the number of tests that's coming, um, being stressed about the homework we have to do. And then if you talk about adults, they're stressed about office work, um, their business, uh, the salary that they earn, uh, household chores they have to do, so on and so forth. But I feel like we don't talk a lot about jobs that exist beyond Earth, and in specific, an astronaut's job, right? They're out there in Earth, kind of like a military person, right? Uh, who A soldier who goes out, leaves his family behind, and we're really uncertain about whether they'll come back or not, right? So that kind of stress is a different stress, and the whole idea or the ideology behind the workshop is to spread the message about stress in space, right? Uh, yeah, so this one is a video. Uh, it's a very, very um, fun, amazing video. It relates psychology and the stress in space. I'll put in the link. Yeah, okay, it works. That's great. So let's watch this, guys. It's a really interesting and amazing video and it's by the Royal Institution. Uh, so I'll just share the song. I'll just share the song. Go for main engines. We have main engines. Two, one. Booster ignition and the final liftoff of Discovery. A tribute to the dedication, hard work, and pride of America's space shuttle team. The shuttle has cleared the tower. Discovery now making one last reach for the stars. I think we've mastered a lot of the physical problems that come along with space travel. But then psychologically, if we haven't really fully understood the amount of stress and strain that people are going to be under. Astronauts need to be on constant alert. Maintaining a stress response for a long period of time can lead to exhaustion. We also have problems with things like intergroup conflict. If you're put in a very closed environment with a lot of other people, this can be very difficult. We also have problems uh, with workload. They're asked to do mo too many experiments, they don't get enough downtime. It can be very difficult for that individual to say, actually, I have um, some thoughts of anxiety or I'm starting to feel some elements of depression. It can be easier to cover up those issues than actually be honest. Now these problems can lead to increases in human error. These aren't big issues when you're on Earth. Everybody makes these everyday slips. However, if you're doing that in a highly risky environment, then that can have really adverse effects. Measuring bodily stress is done now in the space station. They take urine samples and blood samples and so on. But when you're talking about the psychological stresses of space travel, 
uh, the situation is much more complex. One way that we think we can help is to look at their speech, or in particular, to look at their speaking. In other words, the way in which they use speech, the way in which they sound, and the kinds of words that they use when they, when, when they speak. Now let's try backwards. Speech is quite a good test of all kinds of aspects of well-being because it's affected both by the physiological state and the psychological state of the individual. So to explore whether we could use voice to detect changes in mood and uh, psychological well-being, we looked at the recordings made during the Mars 500 simulated mission to Mars. Six cosmonauts were sent on a, a, a nine-month trip inside a, 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 a module, although the, 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 the module didn't go anywhere, it was just parked in a car park. What we were able to show was that analysis of the, of the audio recordings did indeed show situations where uh, a particular speaker may have um, changed their mood or uh, changed what their sort of level of excitement or what they were, or the topic of discussion uh, became exciting and that, that, that affected their, the way in which they spoke. And we were able to identify particular recordings which in our sense were anomalous, that they, um, they didn't seem to follow the standard pattern of the person's speech. And so we can say at this particular day, on this particular recording, the way in which this person was speaking was unusual. Whether the way in which they feel affects the way that they speak and whether we can pick up those signals automatically and then from, those, uh, from that analysis of their voice try and uh, raise the alarm if the uh, characteristics of their voice are sort of outside their normal parameters. So anything we can do to try and monitor and detect these psychological stresses uh, might, be, might be very valuable in protecting the health of the, of the astronaut. On short-term space missions, psychological issues are manageable, but on longer-term space missions, they can become much more important, and overcoming them will really help us in our quest to travel to the stars. Right, I hope all of you were able to gain enough knowledge from the video. Um, let's go back to the presentation. Yep, um, it's there. Yeah, there we are. Okay, so I think we like learned a lot from that video or you, there were a few points that I noticed, I hope that you noticed too, uh, about stress in space, right? So like I said, the whole ideology behind the workshop is to spread awareness about the fact that um, mental health, uh, uh, a dip in mental health would, affect human physical health as well. And it's really important that we spread this awareness and we get to many, um, you know, we get a lot of coverage so that more scientists can research on this fact and how we could overcome this problem with an efficient solution, right? Uh, so yeah, that's our motive. Let's move on. So uh, there was this very interesting article um, or experiment com conducted by the European Space Agency, right? And they're a very uh, well-known space agency. And I was really happy to see that um, work was um, put in and they have initiated um, a task to help astronauts overcome this mental pressure and stress in space. It's it's like, like the um, doctor in the video said that, Longer term space missions can cause a really, really vast effect on um, such astronauts. So it's always necessary that we all work on uh, developing a solution uh, to this, right? I felt 100 years old for a few months on Earth, right? So it's just not in space that astronauts have adverse effects, but back on Earth, when they land back on Earth, too, they are not able to function properly because because they just lived in a new environment and they took a lot to adapt to that one. And then coming back to your old environment and trying to adapt to that one too, it's a lot of effort, right? And mentally, mentally it can be very, very painful and tremendous and uh, terrible, right? Living in space is a wonderful experience, but it can take a 
take its toll on an astronaut's body. Half of astronauts return with weaker immune systems from International Space Station. This, the fact that um, an astronaut know, knows, the, knows that they have a weaker immune system can also take a toll on their mental health. And this is why it's very important to focus on their mental health, right? Um, can we move on something? Yeah. So this is a little slide about stress. And like I've talked pre previously, uh, stress comes in different forms. And now we know that it does not exist just on Earth, right? Uh, stress is a response of the body as it adapts to hostile environments. This broad definition includes stress from speaking in front of an audience, stress from a wound, or stress from, a, from living in weightlessness in a fragile spacecraft far from home. The specific phrase for just a spacecraft far from home is something that I found um, really, really very touching. I saw this in an article, right? So I wanted to talk to you about it. Um, it has a lot of uh, meaning, if, uh, if that makes sense. The first part, this fragile spacecraft, like you never know um, what's going to go wrong, all that stuff, and then you're far from home, right? So like I said, it takes a lot of, um, it, it puts in a lot of impact on one's mental health. The feelings are produced by the central nervous system, working closely with our immune system. Uh, stress in the central nervous system invariably influences the immune system and vice versa. People with stressful jobs seem more likely to get sick. So imagine um, how it would be like for astronauts, right? Is that the beginning of one? Yeah. So this is just like a question that popped up in my head while I was researching about the particular subject. Um, imagine being locked up in a single room with six people over nine months. Uh, sorry about the typo there, but yeah. Um, like, think about it, right? You're conversing with the same people. There are going to be a lot of psychological changes, a lot of um, changes in the way you function, uh, when you wake up, how you talk to them over a period of time. Right. So next slide. Yeah. What do you do when you're stressed? So this is a very interesting question. Like I said, it's an open forum. Go ahead, put, put it in your chat. And I wouldn't want to keep you here longer because I know it's, it's a working day for all of you. So um, go ahead, put it in the chat uh, while I'm speaking. Go ahead and ask questions. Yeah. So I'll talk about me. When I'm stressed, I listen to music, right? So I feel like music gives me the energy um, to put aside my problems or face them or, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I listen to music too. That's great to know that somebody, somebody also uh, listens to the same thing, right? Um, yeah, I feel like music evokes this energy in me, right? To face my problem, acknowledge the fact that I'm stressed, right? And like my counselor taught me at school, uh, stress, stress can be avoided. Instead, it can be managed because as you grow older, you'll have many things to worry about, right? Um, yeah, I go on a car ride or play music on full volume at night with the windows open. Yeah, so that, see, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, music evokes this kind of energy in all of us. Um, and I can see that all of you agree. When I'm stressed, I also play the piano. Piano is a musical in instrument and I've been playing it for quite some time now. And I, I you know, um, get a lot of feeling from it. So yeah, that's me. That's me listening to music. That's all of you listening to music as well. Yep, moving on. Oh, let's see, there's something in the chat. Yeah, it's in nature. Yes, that's also something that relieves your stress. So it need not be music that um, necessarily relieves everybody's stress. It could be drawing, right? Uh, you could draw and you could feel, you know, you can express your emotions. You don't have to talk to anyone, anybody, but somebody else might uh, feel nice talking to someone or uh, somebody else might feel nice just playing a sport um, I play I play football I don't know how many of you play football here but football makes me forget about a lot of, a lot of things whereas listening to music helps me face my problems there are a lot of things yeah so why do I do all this right like I said um, it's therapeutic it's therapeutic and this is this is a very wonderful word, right? Our whole workshop is based on this one word. What makes something therapeutic, right? What is therapy? So um, this is the medical definition of therapy. Um, 
medical treatment for a medical diagnosis. And usually um, you go to a doctor uh, to treat it according to the medical definition that I, I researched and searched up, right? But does it have to be um, with a doctor, right? Does it have to involve a therapist or a psychologist? Uh, maybe, maybe yes, if it's a very serious diagnosis, but if, if not, if it's something like, oh, I have a lot of homework to do, or I have a lot of stuff to do, uh, then, then it would be, you could use something or so, something or um, maybe someone, right? Someone as in your friends or something as in music or drawing or writing. It could be anything, right? So this is what we're trying to implement, musical therapy in space, right? There are hundreds of astronauts out there and getting a doctor for each and every one of them to help them talk to um, someone to help them sort out through their issue would be kind of a tedious task, right? So that's why uh, we have implemented musical therapy into astronomy. And that's my initial idea for astrobeat, right? What is musical therapy? It's important to know what it is and how you use, use it, right? Because not all, all of us listen to the same kind of music. Maybe I find um, nice uh, vibrant music good, but somebody else finds rock music better. So it's always important to know that, um, uh, yeah, that everybody has a varying sense of music. So the use of music is to address the physical, emotional, and cognitive and social needs of a group or individual. So you can see by this one definition that music addresses a lot of aspects in our, in our human brain. It employs a variety of activities such as listening to melodies, playing an instrument, drumming, writing songs, and guided imagery. Music therapy is appropriate for people of all ages, whether you're 60 or whether you're five years old. It, it doesn't really matter, right? Um, so yeah, moving on, do you play an instrument? If you do play an instrument, please put it down in the chat. I'd love to know. Yep, let me just go down. So can you go to the next slide? Oh, that, that's a really cool instrument. I've always wanted to play the ukulele. I've always feared that it would be too hard, so I've never really tried it out too much, but yeah. This is a quote by a violin teacher with the same ideologies as me. Um, space appeared to me as a perfect testing ground to use anti-stress music, right? So there are different types of music, uh, first off, and I've told you that. Um, xylophone. Ooh, my brother plays the drums. That's, that's a really interesting thing. Uh, xylophone, I only wish I could do it. I have never really tried out one, but I'll definitely try it out. Uh, so yeah, like, like I said, music varies from everyone and we need to have a specific kind of music that could help an astronaut, not just anybody, to um, ease their stress because an astronaut goes through different um, stages. Like the first stage would be G-force training and this kind of training that astronaut has to go through um, to face the gravity levels in space, right? And the gravity levels in space are really, really um, how to say, it? it applies a lot of physical pressure on one's body, right? So this G-force training can lead to unconsciousness and a lot of, lot of other um, physical pressure, right? So th that's where music comes into. And then you have takeoff and a lot of other things. So you're staying in space in a new, very new environment where you have never been before. So you need something to ease that stress, right? And that's where music comes in. So music can help release, um, sorry, the previous slide. Yeah, music can help release a cocktail of hormones that have a positive effect on us. Oxytocin, endorphin, serotonin, and dopamine. I'm pretty sure if you, any of you take biology at school, um, you would know this. It's, it's, very, it's a very interesting um, study. You should definitely research on these hormones. Um, yeah, besides the pleasure we get from it, music can also be used to have a prolonged uh, efficiency and reduce anxiety. Anxiety, depression, these are common mental health problems, right? We wouldn't want it to worsen to a stage where you would need a doctor to help you out and it would get worse and you would have to take, it would take a lot of time to overcome it, right? Uh, so stress factors, like I said, mental health, adverse mental health affects your physical health as well and you would you wouldn't have proper sleep and you wouldn't have spatial orientation and so on and so forth moving on 
So yeah, this is where we stop talking about the problem and we start talking about the solution. Solution that I've come up with is musical therapy and we involve it in an astronaut's daily life. So it's implementation of psychology and space and all of that together, right? So this particular solution, according to what I've researched, isn't something that's been talked about a lot, right? And I feel like it should be very much implemented in astronauts' daily life. And they've started doing it and started performing um, experiments and studies on um, astronauts in training to see how they react to certain music and how which music is beneficial and which music is not. So yeah, um, this is an important thing to talk about. What kind of music, right? So there can be rock, um, YB music, and there can be anti-stress music, right? But what suits an astronaut, right? So it has been discovered that slow pitched music works best when astronauts are put in high pressure environment, high pressure environment here being space. So uh, during takeoff, it's a lot of stress, right? Um, you never know how the launch is going to work out and how it's gonna pan out, right? So here, astronauts could be played slow pitch music and that could help them uh, slow down their tension and calm down and hope that the launch goes pretty well, right? So the awareness is what we're trying uh, to create here. Oh, we have somebody here. Once again, let me admit them. Great. Okay, so fun fact, right? There are two guitars, a keyboard and a saxophone, saxophone, sorry, on the International Space Station. How cool is that, right? But I, I honestly think they should have uh, more instruments in the ISS um, to have more activities to engage with. And especially if it makes music, it might be helpful to many other astronauts too. Yeah, moving on. Music taste can vary from person to person. One may like to listen to rap. The other may like to listen to indie music, YB music, rock music, and so on and so forth, right? Okay. So I will have to end quickly, right? Because my other presenter will have to press in too. But this is a small activity you could do anytime in your free time. What does your playlist look like? Now compare your playlist and the activity that's uh, to follow. Sadhvik, if you could go to the next slide, right? Make a playlist, right? Uh, let's just say your dad or your best friend is going to space and they are qualified astronauts and they've been in training uh, for a long time and now they're going to space. So they're gonna be in space for let's just say two months or let, let's make it four, right? And that's a pretty long period of time. What are they gonna do there? So make them a playlist. And remember, you're not making a playlist for an ordinary person. Um, you're making a playlist for an astronaut, right? Um, and in space, uh, in space, it's going to be different for them. So maybe maybe make sure that you abide by their tastes and not your taste, right? You're making a music for a music playlist for them. So make a playlist and give it to them, even though this is a very hypothetical situation, make sure to show them your playlist later on, right? So like, yeah, this is what I just told you all. Make sure to show them the playlist. It's always nice um, when, you know, somebody makes a playlist for you, right? So yeah, this is our entire motive behind the workshop, music therapy beyond earth, right? So thank you guys, that's my session. Again, if there are any questions, please put it in the chat or email to us. The email is put in the chat and also on the slide. And I'll be giving um, the mic to our other presenter. And yes, I think if you're here, awesome. Hello everyone, thank you so much for sticking around for so long. And thank you, Fida, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, you shared okay. his research and his opinion on uh, why musical therapy is so, such a pressing issue and why it's so beneficial for astronauts in space. Awesome. Uh, so our other presenter, Satvik, will be talking about a little bonus, right, um, on astronomy, if any of you are interested in careers in astronomy and, yeah, history of modern astronomy. So I hope you all enjoy I'm going to attempt to make you guys excited about astronomy. I hope you can hear me well and you can see the presentation. If there are any issues, let me know. And of course, um, uh, you guys can uh, send in any questions you may have in the chat box and we'll get to answer them. Both of us will get to answer them at the end. 
So I'm going to try to get you guys excited about astronomy and I'm going to do that through history by explaining the history of modern astronomy and explain a few events that really shaped astronomy and what uh, what it has in store for the future. So in 1987, a Chilean engineer named Oscar de Gallo uh, became the only living person on the planet to discover a rare astronomical event with the naked eye. Oscar was a telescope operator at Las Campanas uh, Operatory Observatory in Chile. He worked with the astronomers who came to the observatory for their research, uh, running the telescopes and processing the data that they took. On the night of um, of the night of February twenty fourth, Oscar stepped outside for a break and looked up to the night sky and he saw this picture. He saw this and he noticed that something was strange here. And to us, this might just seem a be- a, a, like a beautiful night sky, but it wasn't to this Chilean astronomer. That is because he had memorized the night sky. This is the large uh, Magellanic cloud, which is the large Magellanic cloud, this one. And it is a satellite galaxy that is very close to our own Milky Way, and it is very much like our own Milky Way galaxy. But on that February night, Oscar noticed that something was different about this galaxy. Uh, it, had quite, it didn't quite look the same as it did before. And uh, this small point of light had appeared in one corner of the galaxy. What's a small point of light? This small point of light. And um, we might not be able to observe it, but he was able to do that because he kept records of the night sky. And um, it is quite amazing and quite difficult to explain how Oscar managed to notice this. To do this, we need to zoom out and look at what the southern sky looks like. Uh, the large Magellanic cloud is right in the middle of that image over here. And uh, despite its name, it's very small. It's not large at all. Uh, imagine trying to see this on a single, uh, trying to see this and notice a single new point in the light, night sky appearing in this vast galaxy. Um, he worked on this data for this galaxy because he had the large Magellanic cloud essentially memorized. Uh, he had worked on this data for this galaxy for several years, poring over the night of observations and doing it by hand. Because Oscar had begun his work in astronomy at the time when we stored all data we observed from the universe on fragile sheets of glass. These are the sheets of glass we will talk about later on. All, all pictures of the night sky were stored on that piece of glass. Emily Levesque is this astronaut, is this American astronaut, and here she is giving a, a TEDx talk at uh, a TEDx Berkeley. So here's a shot of the moon. It's familiar. It's a familiar sight to us, but there are a couple of unusual things about this image. For one, Emily Levesque flipped the colors. It originally looked like this. And if we zoom out, we can see how this picture was taken. This is a photograph of the moon taken on 1984, in 1984 on a glass photographic plate. This was a technology that astronomers had available for decades to store the observations that we took of the night sky. And uh, here she is uh, at the TEDx stage, and she actually brought a sample of the glass plate to show everyone. Now, the unique thing about this glass plate is that one side is clear and the other side is dark. Uh, these glass plates are very difficult to work with. One of them was treated with a chemical emulsion that would, uh, that would darken when it was exposed to light. This is how these plates were able to store the images that, the, uh, able to store the pictures that they were taken. So what would happen is uh, they would enter a dark room and uh, uh, the entire telescope would be fitted inside a dark room and this glass panel would be fitted inside the telescope. And uh, when lights struck the telescope's plate, those points would be brightened and we would get this um, uh, inverse image of, the, of, the, of whatever we're observing in the night sky. That would ha- then have to be interpreted to develop this image. Um, so this is how uh, they were able to store the images that they, they took back in the day. And uh, this meant that astronomers had to work with these plates in darkness. These plates had to be cut to a very specific size so they could fit into the camera of the telescope. So astronomers would take razor sharp cutting tools and slice these giant, tiny, these giant, tiny pieces of glass all in the dark. Astronomers also had all kinds of tricks they would use to make these plates respond to the light a little faster. They would bake them, freeze them, and they would soak them in ammonia, or they would pour them with lemon juice all in the dark. Because as I said, if you expose them to the light, the light would imprint on the dark side of the glass and the plates would then be, uh, will not be useful anymore. 
So astronomers would take these carefully designed plates to the telescope and load them in the camera again, all in the dark. Uh, it was uh, because it was all in the dark, it was impossible to tell which side was the right one because the dark side of the telescope had to face the outside lens, as in the light had to enter and uh, hit on the dark side of the dark side of the glass. So um, when, when they actually put it in the camera, it was difficult to see which side was the right side, which side would be the right side facing the opening of the telescope. Uh, so because of this, they would uh, tap, the plate, uh, tap the plate to the lips to try to see which side of the plate was sticky. The sticky side was the dark side. And uh, this was a very big challenge because astronomers like this had to do it all in the dark. And by the way, if someone can guess who this astronomer is, you can put it in the chat box. If anyone can guess who this astronomer is, a very famous astronomer. And uh, if I say the name, you'll definitely know what I'm talking about. There's been one of his, his things that were named after him recently uh, were in the news. And uh, maybe you can think of something from that. Okay. So, uh, so astronomers who take these uh, delicately cut, meticulously treated, very baby plates into the telescope, but it would actually end up loaded in the back side of the camera. So, um, and also sometimes you had to curve these um, pl glass plates in order for them to fit into the uh, telescope camera. And that, again, that have to be done in the dark without any specialized machines. And uh, it would have to be done just by hand. So sometimes if you were unlucky, that would just break. So astronomers would uh, ride in elevators high into the building and then climb onto the top of the telescope and stay there all night in the shivering cold, transferring plates in and out of the camera opening and something like this. That is the telescope and they had to stay over there overnight in the cold night and they had to transfer plates in and out of the camera opening, closing the shutter then pointing the telescope to whatever part of the night sky they want to study and then opening the shutter and placing the glass plate. These astronomers worked with operators who would stay on the ground over there. And um, uh, uh, this was an astronomer observing a very complicated plate at the Lick Observatory in California. He was sitting at the top of the yellow structure that you see in the dome on the lower right. And uh, so he had been, uh, uh, he'd been uh, exposing one plate to the sky for hours, crossed down in the cold, keeping the telescope perfectly pointed to this uh, to take this precious picture of the part of a small part of the universe and his operator which was down on the ground wandered at the dome at some point in the night just to check on if check on the astronomer to see if everything's okay and by chance he brushed past the wall and flipped the light on so the switch uh, the light switched on in the dome so all the lights came blazing and flooded the astronomer and he started yelling and cursing because uh, yelling and cursing saying what have you done you've destroyed so much hard work and uh, he literally said i want to get down and kill you so he starts so the astronomer starts moving out his telescope moving down his elevator and trying to get inside the dome so he starts moving and uh, the operator who's on the ground floor he starts moving as well he starts moving the telescope itself forward he starts moving the telescope towards the entrance of the elevator so that he can't climb down so the astronomer can't climb down and enter the dome and uh, as he's approaching the elevator the elevator suddenly starts spinning away because the astronomer can take control of the telescope but the operator can take control of the dome uh, and take control of the opening of the uh, elevator so the astro the operator is looking up he's really mad and this uh, this is the situation that they had back in the day now if you haven't already guessed this is the astronomer whose uh, name is on the Hubble telescope. This is Edwin Hubble. And this entire charade of uh, the slow motion game of chase and chasing uh, chasing with the lights on and the dome just spinning around must have looked completely ridiculous. Thankfully, that's not the way they do it these days. And when the American astronomer, Emily Levesque, tells people about using this photographic plate to study the universe, it sounds absolutely ridiculous. How could they have not developed another way? Now, they couldn't have developed another way because essentially they had to take a picture out of the night sky. And because there weren't any digital telescopes in the first place, they could not rely on a light falling down on any other surface like film to take as precise of an image. And uh, it is a little absurd to see that uh, astronomers studied a galaxy and make, made hypothesis and corrected the hypothesis using primitive tools like these. Um, and um, 
this is Edwin Hubble and Hubble used the photographic plates to completely change our understanding of how big the universe is, despite its flaws. The plate that Hubble took back in this image is known as the, sorry about that. This is the image that uh, Edwin Hubble took and uh, this was taken back in 1923. And at the time, this was the Andromeda Nebula. If someone can correct that in the chat, Andromeda Nebula, is there something wrong with it? There might be, there should be something wrong with it. But at that time, this image was known as the Andromeda Nebula. Um, and you can see that the, uh, the corner, he has named it WAR, WAR, and he's even put an exclamation point on it. Because when he got this image, he realized there some, must be something wrong with this. This is, by the way, the dark spot is meant to be the bright spot. And uh, this is meant to be the darkened area. As you can see, it's a negative of uh, the part of the night sky. And uh, there is a meaning of this WAR. It's, it stands for variable. Because what Edwin Hubble noticed was that this part of the night sky, this image that he kept observing, had some portions of this image kept changing every time he uh, took this image. And he wasn't able to explain why this nebula was uh, giving different readings uh, or had some different position, positioning every single time. And the reason is because this is not the Andromeda Nebula. This is the Andromeda Galaxy. And uh, has someone in the chat found it? Yes. Uh, great Vidang, Vidang. I hope I pronounced it right. He found it. This is the Andromeda Galaxy or the Andromeda Nebula. But at that time, he thought that this was a nebula which in fact was a galaxy and that was able that was able to explain his changing results in his image. Um, so this was the Andromeda galaxy, the entire separate is uh, an entire separate two and a half million lights away. And uh, it's two, two, and a half, two and a half million light years away from our own Milky Way and it's a separate galaxy. This was the first evidence of other galaxies existing in our uni in a universe beyond our own. And it totally changed the understanding of how big the universe was and how, uh, and how much uh, mass it contained. So now we look at telescopes of the present day. This is a modern day picture of the Andromeda galaxy. And uh, it looks just like the telescope photos that we see and love to enjoy. It's colorful and detailed and beautiful. We now store these data digitally and we take it using telescopes like these. Uh, uh, like these. And um, we now are able to store this data digitally. And uh, this is the astronomer, the American astronomer, Emily Levesque, standing underneath a mirror that is 26 feet across Bigger telescopes help us take better and clearer and sharper images. They also make it easier for us to gather light from faint and far away objects. So a bigger telescope literally helps us farther, uh, reach further into the universe, looking at things that we were no, not able to see before. This is Emily Levesque working um, on her research at, at that time in New Mexico, but she doesn't have to be in the um, in the operator room at the time uh, when she wants to use the telescope. She doesn't have to be in the operator room. That is because she can work all the way, she can work on this telescope in New Mexico all the way from any other state in, uh, let's say, uh, Nevada or even uh, New York. Emily Levis can sit on her couch in Seattle and still command uh, the telescope to run operations from her laptop telling the telescope where to point uh, and where to open and close the shutter. Now, when Emily Levesque wants to take the picture of the universe now, all from those many states away, she can finally operate it uh, using the modern technology. But has anything fundamentally changed from our, um, from an astronomer's experience from now and then? Yes, an astronomer's experience has changed. Uh, how the astronomer operates the telescope has changed, but the fundamental um, curiosity of the astronomers remains the same. Um, one of the biggest questions that still focuses on uh, that still focuses on how things change in the night sky have remained the same, and they're still trying to answer the same questions. Um, the changing night sky is exactly what Oscar Duholland, Oscar Duholland saw when he took that image with his naked eye in 1987. This point of light that he saw appearing in the large Magellanic cloud. Oh, sorry, guys. This was the image. This is the uh, Magellanic uh, 
Magellanic galaxy that uh, Oscar de Holland was trying to observe back in the day, and it turned out to be a supernova. This was the first naked eye supernova seen from Earth in more than 400 years, and it's pretty cool. But a couple of you might be looking at this image and going, really, I've heard of supernova, and they can be huge. A supernova, is, if you guys didn't know, is the birth of a star, and it's supposed to be spectacular, and it's supposed to look something like this, a birth of a star. These brilliant, explosive deaths, oh, sorry, sorry, a death of a star, not birth of a star. <laughs> supernova is meant to be the death of a star. So these brilliant, explosive deaths of enormous, massive stars, and they shoot energy out into the universe. They spew material out into the space, and they look, um, and they sound noticeable, and they, su and they look very noticeable, and it sounds very obvious that they must be brilliant explosions. So how could this be a supernova? Well, that is because this supernova took place 100, 100 light years away. And uh, uh, sorry, this uh, supernova took place a billion light years away. And whereas this supernova is, this is an artistic interpretation of what a supernova would uh, look like if it was just 100 light years away. And that's like uh, backyard terms when it comes to astronomy. And if a supernova like this has happened uh, a billion light years away, then this would just look like a little dot in the sky which is exactly what he observed back in the day, a little dot, which is changed on his glass plate. Uh, this is the Vera Rubin uh, Observatory in Chile, where the astronomer had, uh, where the astronomer had made the observation for the uh, supernova that we just discussed. And when Emily Levesque visited this Mac in March, it was still under construction, but this telescope will begin operations uh, next and when it does, it will take out, it will carry out a simple but spectacular observing program. And this telescope will photograph the entire southern sky every few days over the next, over, over following a preset pattern of 10 years. Computers, algorithms, and uh, computers and algor algorithms will be facilitating this observatory and will compare every pair of images taken from the same patch of the night sky, looking for anything that's got brighter or dimmer and essentially trying to find out what a essentially, essentially trying to find out if there is a variable star in the night sky there uh, or even looking for something that has appeared like a supernova so a star that is now blurred and not focused when even when the telescope is focused at the um, at the same position right now we discover about a thousand supernova every year and the Rubin observatory will be able will be capable of discovering thousand supernova every night it is going to dramatically change the face of astronomy and how we study things in the night sky. It will do all of this largely without much of human intervention at all, because as I said, it's all pre-programmed and all the uh, dates on which the shutter must open and close are preset. It will follow a definite preset pattern and will computationally find anything that's changed or disappeared. Um, and some of you might be thinking that this might sound a little sad that we're removing people from stargazing, as they're not letting other astronomers come out and uh, and use us and use telescopes. But that's not true because in reality, our their role as astronomers isn't disappearing; it's just moving. We've already seen how we do our job, how our jobs change, and how the work we do, and maybe you have seen how the work your parents do have changed. The the astronomers have gone from perching atop telescopes or sitting night next to them, even when it's not required, all the way back in this image when Edmund Hubble was sitting in the elevator even when it was not required or when he was trying to fix the uh, glass, delicate glass mirror or try to bend it in all in the dark. That's no longer required. Um, gathering data is only the first step, but astronomers still shine, still shine is in asking questions and working with the data, analyzing it where we can really apply and understand what's happening in the universe, answering different questions. And that's what I talked about before, human curiosity, still remains the same and it makes us ask, it makes us ask questions like um, how big the universe will be and when did it begin and how it's going to end and are we all alone so this is the power that humans are still able to bring to astronomy so comparing capabilities of a telescope like this like this to this uh, we discovered amazing things we discovered amazing things with glass plates but astronomy looks very different to that. And comparing the capabilities of telescopes like this to telescopes like this, we're able to do much more. 
if we can harness the power of tomorrow's technology and combine it with this drive that we all have to look up to the night sky and ask questions of what we see and what our future will be, we'll be able to learn something new and something incredible about our universe. Thank you. I hope the presentation was insightful and you learned something new. If you have some questions, do let me know. Also, uh, I should say that I made a mistake somewhere in the middle by saying uh, the um, uh, supernova was a billion light years away. That's, that's, I don't know where that came up with. It's not a billion light years away. It's 200,000 light years away. And uh, the supernova was uh, discovered all the way back um, in the 1920s. It's, it's still called the Magellanic Cloud. And it wasn't just uh, a burst of uh, space dust. It was. It turned out to be a supernova, which was two hundred thousand light years away. Okay. Awesome, awesome presentation, Sapphic. Um, I was also keenly listening to it. Uh, I hope all of you enjoyed that. And with that, we are actually done pretty early than the actual um, uh, time allotted for this workshop. That is because our uh, mentor wasn't, uh, our expert uh, mentor wasn't here to help us and give us some advice and some fun talk and cool activities. It was really uh, because of technicality issues and he had some personal work to address, but he did uh, send uh, me a message and tell um, all of you that uh, he was really looking forward to this webinar and he would be coming up soon in the further workshops in the next few weeks, um, depending on uh, my schedule and Sadwik's schedule. And I know how it is to be like students and coming on workshops right after school. Really, really appreciate the fact that you joined us today. Uh, please do spread the webinar. Uh, message the whole organization message, uh, tell them to your friends who are interested in STEM and the future we have plans of um, space entrepreneurship or career advice in space um, by other professors um, and experts, right? Uh, any questions, again, please send them to our email. We'd be more than happy to answer. I'll definitely check any uh, team applications or ambassador applications. Uh, if any of you don't know what ambassador applications are, ambassador applications are picking up the program and teaching it in uh, your school or your country. So I highly suggest something you should apply for. It would serve as a great extracurricular activity. And the time you leave the program, you can always um, ask for certification so you can include it as one of your key extracurricular activities while applying to university. So with that, we end the program. Um, here at 4.30, uh, all of you, I hope all of you have a great, great evening uh, and stay safe, my friends. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thanks for joining. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. <laughs> I